Hello, and welcome to The Conspiracy Show. I'm Richard Serrett. In the early morning of August 5th, 1962, Hollywood legend Marilyn Monroe was found dead in her Brentwood, California home by her housekeeper and psychiatrist. The official cause of death was acute barbiturate poisoning. The passage of time, however, has done nothing to diminish her status as America's favorite sex symbol, nor the suspicions and speculations about what really happened that night. On this episode of The Conspiracy Show, we'll examine the mysterious circumstances surrounding the death of screen legend Marilyn Monroe. We're about to hear from several researcher authors who believe Monroe's death was not the result of an accidental overdose or by suicide. They contend Monroe was murdered because she knew too much as a result of her long speculated affairs, first with President John F. Kennedy and later with U.S. Attorney General Robert F. Kennedy. And as always, we'll hear from a skeptic who will argue Marilyn's death had nothing to do with her affairs with JFK or RFK or state secrets she scribbled down in her infamous Red Diary. Her death at the age of 36, he says, was most likely an accidental overdose. And while that may not be as sensational or exciting as a conspiracy, it's the most rational explanation based on the available facts. Me? I'm just looking for the truth, and I'm willing to follow it wherever it leads. It is time to redefine reality. Genetic enigma, a human alien. Mainstream media technology can alter weather patterns. Created by the Monroe's naked body is discovered face down in her bed by her housekeeper, Eunice Murray. But a number of researchers claim there are multiple problems with the official timeline of the events surrounding Monroe's death and the actual death scene itself. Normally, when she went to sleep, she wore a bra, so the fact that she didn't have one is very suspicious. And she would have dressed up in some clothes. It's very rare, according to many uh, medical professionals, that you find a suicide in the nude. You know, it just doesn't happen that way usually. So it's very odd that she was naked. What else was unusual or suspicious uh, about the death scene? There was no water glass. Had she swallowed 47 nebutals and 17 chlorohydrates, surely there should be some, something to wash it down with. You're not gonna swallow it you know, by itself. You choke on the tablets. I was lucky enough to speak to the first LAPD police officer on the scene, uh, whose name was Jack Clemens. He said he got a call at 4.25 a.m. And the caller was a man who said, Marilyn Monroe uh, uh, just committed suicide. Uh, she's dead. And, and, and he, thought, he thought it was a joke. He said, he said it just, whoever calls and says, you know, the biggest star in the world is just committed suicide and is dead. Clemens arrives at Monroe's house, knocks on the door, and is greeted by Monroe's housekeeper, Eunice Murray. And she said, well, around midnight, I, I woke up and I found her dead at midnight. And so he says, wait a minute, you found her dead at midnight, but <laughs> you call me, the police, at 4.25 a.m. Eunice Murray would later change her story several times. Finally, she claimed that she did not discover Monroe's body until closer to 3.50 a.m. Why would you wait for four and a half hours with a dead body in your house to call the police. She couldn't answer. He said she was stuttering and stuttering and she just, she could not answer. However, Monroe's publicist, who was attending a concert that night at the Hollywood Bowl, received a phone call around 10 p.m. from Monroe's agent, Pat Newcomb, who was at Monroe's house at the time of her death. It was Pat Newcomb who called Arthur and said, hey, you know, Marilyn's in trouble. She's on, she's either dying or on the point of death and then we need you to get over here. Several people went to Marilyn's home at that time, but they did not keep it as a official record. So he got there at about 11 p.m. At 10.30, we know Marilyn is dead. Yet, we don't get a call till the next day at 4.25 a.m. officially. So it's very strange that if her, uh, she was known to be dying about 10.30, why would they wait four and a half hours to call the police? You know, obviously they didn't call right after she died. 
or there had been FBI uh, uh, agents who were at the house. There was a there were CIA operatives that are placed at the house. There was more law enforcement at her house than you would expect to even uh, see, perhaps with a uh, you know a diplomat or a ambassador. Uh, so there was a lot of officials at her house. But again, we have the official story and we have the unofficial story. So there's a lot, a lot that went on that night. The whole thing started with her singing happy birthday to Jack Kennedy. At that time, his wife said, that's it. If you see this woman again, I'm leaving. When they investigated her body, there were no marks on her body to indicate that anybody had done anything to her. Okay. She had a huge overdose of uh, chloral hydrate and other sleeping pills. So it was assumed, given her suicidal background, because she was always threatening suicide, by the way, that she must have actually killed herself. Most of the information at the time was covered up. We didn't know about all this other stuff that was going on. In the coroner's office, you have an autopsy that happened by Dr. Noguchi, and next thing you know, like a day or two after it, all the body parts disappear. Every, you know, organ, uh, the stomach, the intestine, the kidney, the liver, um, the stomach content that was 20 cc of liquid, which is just regular mucus and, and, and hydrochloric acid in your stomach. We all have that. The autopsy report that I have with me here uh, clearly states that the stomach is completely empty. It states no residue of the pills is noted. Now, why is that significant? The fact they found no pills or refractile crystals anywhere in the digestive system proves definitively at those high volumes not to have anything, no remnants, is, is almost impossible. And the reason is when the hydrochloric acid hits the pills, the nembutol or chloral hydrate, basically what happens is that you have crystals formed. And these crystals were never found anywhere in her digestive system. And that is why that 20 cc they had disappeared overnight. So when they went to retest it to see how bizarre this is that, you know, she did not take what killed her orally, all the body parts have disappeared. What do you make of the theory that she was murdered? This is the popular theory. This is the popular mythology. Listen, I, I think that Marilyn Monroe was someone who had attempted suicide a number of times uh, as um, an attention-seeking device. I think that she was someone who was deeply troubled. Uh, her final movie, uh, which never came to be, something has got to give, uh, was uh, unfinished. She was fired from that film um, because of her unreliable nature. And I think that she was at a, a, a down point in her life. And I think that uh, one attention-seeking suicide too many left her dead uh, in the middle of the night alone in her bedroom. The whole thing started with her singing happy birthday to Jack Kennedy. Happy birthday, Mr. President. At that time, his wife said, that's it. If you see this woman again, I'm leaving you. So he cut off contact with Marilyn. But Robert had had a long-term affair with her, much longer than Jack, and much more extensive. Bobby Kennedy was present at her house at 2 p.m. with Peter Lawford on the last day of her life, trying to convince Marilyn not to go through with a press conference. Well, the fact that Bobby Kennedy was in Los Angeles the night that Marilyn Monroe died, and at her house, is very well documented. And when Marilyn had threatened a press conference, Bobby's reply was, if you threaten me, Marilyn, there's more than one way to keep you quiet. Detective Lynn Franklin, uh, who was a Beverly Hills police officer I interviewed, he explained that he pulled over Bobby Kennedy that night and that Peter Lawford was driving. He was there solely to get her diary so that she would not have evidence of anything to use on Monday morning, August 6th, where she had 
threatened to call this press conference exposing her relationships with Jack Kennedy and Bobby Kennedy. So Bobby was spotted there by the Beverly Hills Police. Uh, and then you have, you have the FBI chief on camera that I have stating that they were following Bobby, they knew he was there. Why did he go to Los Angeles? He obviously, it was a covert operation, it was a, it was a quiet operation. He wanted to go and basically um, speak to Marilyn without having his voice recorded on a telephone. The only way to do it properly is you go face to face, you make sure that the house doesn't have bugs, and, and you talk to the, to the individual. Now, when they talked, Bobby was so paranoid that they actually went, this is what the FBI agent told me, they actually went to the guest cottage to talk because they were afraid the main house was bugged, which it was bugged. So he definitely was at the house. He de there was definitely a lot that happened as far as um, Marilyn ended up dead. And then he injects it directly into her heart. A couple minutes later, he says, I'm going to pronounce her dead, you can leave. In his book, Marilyn Monroe, A Case for Murder, author Jay Margolis lays out his own alternative timeline leading to Monroe's death. Margolis believes Monroe's last phone call was to Mexican screenwriter Jose Bolognos. At approximately 9.45 p.m., Monroe heard a crash she believed came from the guest cottage on her property. Monroe told Bolognos she'd be right back, and she put the phone down. She would then discover three men in the guest cottage, one of whom she knew intimately. She finds Bobby Kennedy and two men with him, and they throw her on the bed, they put a pillow over her face to shut her up, and then they give her a drug enema filled with 13 to 19 nebutals and about 17 chlorohydrates to knock her out and makes her unconscious. And then after Bobby and the two men do not find the red diary that they're looking for, which belonged to Monroe, they leave about 10.30, and then Mrs. Murray, the housekeeper, and her son-in-law, who was present, Norman Jeffries, said that the Kennedy, uh, Kennedy and the two men left at 10.30. I don't buy it. I think Robert Kennedy was uh, a moral man. He was someone, I think, who, you know, maybe played fast and loose with uh, some of his uh, uh, marital ethics, but I think beyond that, I think he was someone who was pretty by the book, and I just don't believe uh, that he would look at a Hollywood actress who was obviously damaged, uh, and who was obviously someone who was, um, you know, could be dealt with in any number of ways if, in fact, there was a problem that he had to deal with, um, with her, which I don't believe, but. If there was, there's a hundred different ways to deal with her other than killing. And other than, again, creating this elaborate kind of murder plot and, and uh, or, you know, suicide plot. It just doesn't make sense to me. Mrs. Murray's uh, son-in-law, uh, Norman Jeffries, provides a timeline that Kennedy arrived at the house shortly after 9.30 p.m. and that he left at 10.30 p.m. Marilyn was perfectly fine before Kennedy went into that house. And then she's naked, unconscious, holding the phone in the guest cottage when Norman Jeffries and the housekeeper, Mrs. Murray, had returned. So Mrs. Murray did the right thing and called an ambulance. The principals involved did not anticipate that Mrs. Murray would call an ambulance. And this is where James Hall and Murray Leibowitz had arrived as ambulance attendants at Marilyn's house. All James Hall notices is Pat Newcomb screaming hysterically, leading him into the guest cottage where Marilyn is uh, face up on the bed with no sheet and no blanket, which gives great credence to the enema theory because why would all the sheets be removed? And so he finds a naked Marilyn, he takes her off the bed, he, he puts a resuscitator on her, it's doing fine, it's, her air is coming back, her color and everything is, is returning, and they could safely take her to the hospital, but all of a sudden, Marilyn's psychiatrist, Dr. Greenson, comes in and says, remove the resuscitator. And all he identifies himself is, I am her doctor. That's what Dr. Greenson says to the ambulance attendant. He pulls out a hypodermic syringe with a heart needle already affixed to it. He fills it up with a brownish fluid, which is not adrenaline. It is Nebutal. And then he injects it directly into her heart. A couple minutes later, he says, I'm going to pronounce her dead. You can leave. He tells that to the ambulance attendant. And at that point, Marilyn is deceased. Hey, Ralph Greenson was a lecturer at the USC Medical School, so I had met him a number of times. Very charming guy, but totally irresponsible and misbehaving. 
I actually knew people who knew about him. Uh, I have friends who were in the same psychoanalytic types of societies, and there were great rumors about him sleeping with Marilyn. He did a horrible job in terms of treating her. He didn't di correctly diagnose her at all. And aside from whether he slept with her or not, he was the worst possible psychiatrist for her. And she was getting ready to fire him the next day, as well as the housekeeper, Eunice. According to Peter Lawford in his last interview in 1983, Bobby had tricked Greenson. He lied to Greenson and said, not only is, is Marilyn gonna go public on Monday morning, August 6th, with the affairs of me and Jack, but Bobby told Greenson, lied to him, and said, she's gonna go public with your affair too with Marilyn. He did not want to be found out that he had sex with the most famous woman in the world. It would ruin his career, and he, it may even land him in prison, according to Peter Lawford's statement. Marilyn Monroe was a major national security risk, a problem that had to be eliminated. Marilyn was a huge problem. She loved, you know, uh, uh, Khrushchev and Gromyko and Russians and the Russian arts and, and her instructor, uh, you know, uh, Michael Chekhov. And, and Khrushchev had personally invited Marilyn on September 19, uh, 1959 to go to the Moscow Theater. And she had even applied for a visa. And the FBI files go on and on freaking out. Let's assume for a moment that there was a dalliance with John F. Kennedy and Marilyn Monroe. And there was pillow talk, and she took notes. And when she was spurned, she was, according to some reports, threatening to go to the press. This is happening at the height of the Cold War. The Cuban Missile Crisis was just getting underway. It's easy to see how the CIA might feel that she was posing a severe national security risk and had to be gotten rid of. I would say to that, show me the diary, of course, these diaries, these things that, you know, are apparently uh, so important to uh, the conspiracies, of course, they always disappear. They're gone. No one ever seems to be able to find these things. Her sympathies with the Russians uh, really got on the nerves of the FBI and CIA, and I could understand why. Uh, JFK and Marilyn Monroe had one one-night stand, uh, which from what I understand uh, in terms of the ex-president's uh, sexual dalliances is that he wasn't doing a lot of talking during these uh, situations that he found himself in. What's happening in 1962, in, in August when she died, the Cuban Missile Crises. Right before that, in 61, you had the Bay of Pigs invasion. We unsuccessfully tried to invade Cuba, so they were after us. First of all, I would hope that the President of the United States would be smart enough not to uh, divulge national secrets to uh, a Hollywood, an unstable Hollywood actress that he happened to be, find himself naked with. While all of this is happening, the, the tension was unbelievable. It was, it, was, it was as intense as September 11, terrorists, Al-Qaeda. And two, I would uh, assume that from what I've read and what I've heard about him, that the situation didn't uh, loan itself to uh, you know, him unburdening himself of you know, uh, uh, secrets that were going to change the course of the history of the United States. Marilyn Monroe was a major national security risk. Marilyn Monroe was a liability, a problem that had to be eliminated. I think that, that, that the pillow talk had revealed a lot of national secrets, which were very dangerous at the time when Castro was threatening the United States with missiles. Peter Lawford said one year before he died, he said, quote, Marilyn has got to be silent, Bobby told Greenson, or words to that effect. Greenson had thus been set up by Bobby to take care of Marilyn, end quote. Now, the ambulance attendant said he saw Greenson do it with a long heart needle to the chest. So this just, you know, gives credence to Peter Lawford's testimony. This will never die. It will never go away. I promise you, 2,000 years from now, whether the U.S. is around or not, this will be a legendary thing everyone will talk about. Look at Cleopatra. She had an affair with Julius Caesar 2,000 years ago. 2,000 years later, we're discussing if she committed suicide or if she was murdered. This will never, ever go away, except my book and documentary does prove definitively that she was murdered, 
and that there was a federal government cover-up and Bobby Kennedy was at the house. Accidental overdose, suicide, murder. If Bobby Kennedy was involved in the plot to murder Marilyn Monroe to keep her quiet, I find it hard to believe that he would actually show up at Marilyn's house on the night of her death. Still, there is pretty credible evidence to suggest that he was there, but why? I think a far more plausible scenario is that some rogue element within the FBI, the CIA, or the Secret Service decided Marilyn Monroe represented a significant threat to national security and she had to be silenced. And likely, this heinous crime was carried out after Bobby had left. The murder was then covered up by the Los Angeles Police Department and various other intelligence groups. But regardless of who killed Marilyn Monroe, why and how, the combination of her vulnerability, her naivete, and the powerful men in her life would prove to be far more lethal than any barbiturates she supposedly took that night. And now, I'd like to know what you think. Get in touch with me through the website, theconspiracyshow.com. In the meantime, don't move.